welcome. Can you all hear me? Testing. Yes. Any journey, whether personal, spiritual, empowerment related, it's pretty useless if you don't know how to rest in the light of God. To rest in the light of God is crucial to gain perspective, to gain overview to know yourself. So self-actualization or self-empowerment needs to be balanced with self-realization or knowing oneself at ever deeper levels of true naked satchidananda or existence awareness bliss. And the process is quite simple as I laid out in this past season. Um, I think there's a few who have never been here before. Wow. Quite a few. Um, awesome. So I would encourage you, because I probably won't repeat everything I've said in the last eight sessions today. Who knows? It might happen. Um, I recommend you go to bentinyamasaro.tv, uh, subscribe there, and then you can see all the eight sessions of this season. And then you can practice and be all up to date for when we will resume um, in about a month. So obviously everyone is on a journey, and those journeys are filled with content. They're filled with different contexts. They're filled with data, with information, with experiences, with definitions, with labels, with energy, with relationships. And so it's important in such a rich world of concepts, of constant bombardment with concepts, it's crucial to be able to develop the ability to drop all that and consistently rest in the light of God or simply the light of your own being. And really there is only being because nothing else has any isness. Thus it doesn't exist. Whatever the mind comes up with, whatever forms it projects, whatever world it references all the time, it's always referencing a world. That world actually lacks any and all beingness. There is no beingness in projecting a world. There's no isness in thinking of another person. There is no isness to that. It doesn't exist. It's a complete illusion. It's a complete dream. The only thing that exists is that which exists. Makes sense, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so that which exists must have isness. If you develop the ability to check in with your direct experience and notice that which has isness, then you're resting in the truth, which is existence, consciousness, bliss. Or existence or being, awareness, bliss. Sat, chit, ananda. It's an Indian term or Sanskrit term. I don't even know. One of these two or both. Or, um, and so awareness of being is bliss. You know, bliss is the luster that comes from that. Sometimes I call it love light. And so these three components, isness, awareness, and bliss, are the primary colors of all of creation. There's not a single experience that does not exist as Satchidananda. In fact, no experience whatsoever exists apart from or independent of Satchidananda. So, what we tend to do on a day-to-day -day basis is project a world, project a story, project even a spiritual journey onto ourselves, full of concepts, and none of that exists. None of that has isness. It's just a thought, it's just a projection. So every time that we drop the mind, every time that we drop those concepts, and we return to that primordial sense of existence, which 
underlies, constitutes all appearances, all data points, all experiences that arise and go, arise and disappear. If we can tune into that changeless reality, we can start to drop our skin, we can start to shed our different bodies, our different minds, our different projections, the world, others, and we can unwind until we are able to perceive ourselves in our most naked primordial state, which is that of God, which is that of pure being, but without the sense of location. Many people think they're practicing pure beingness, but it's completely filled with objects. It's completely filled with the container of, I'm a body that's over here and I'm being mindful of my existence. That's scratching the surface of your direct experience of God. To go deeper, you need to drop your sense of being the body. You need to drop your sense of having a location. You need to drop your sense of there being such a thing as location. <coughs> so that when you can come undone in locationless awareness, awareness aware of its own existence without any filters, without any projections of independent existences of space and time and location and others and objects and spiritual journeys and your ego and how far you've come, how far you still have to go. It's all relatively le relevant in your mind to your story and your projection. But if you don't balance that with dropping the whole story of you and going beyond even your sense of core individuality, even beyond the soul. The soul level is that which I would call the I am. It's that core sense of I exist, I am. Can you find that? Right now in your experience, by simply taking a deep breath, relaxing the body and the mind and the thoughts, and noticing that there is a sense of I exist that remains. The deeper you go into this, the more and more naked it becomes. Drop the I, exist. And just notice existing, existence. To rest into that existence is the universal I. It doesn't come with location. Location needs to be conjured up with what I call a mental container imagination. And again, how many of your life experiences have you had without the sense of location? <laughs> what would happen to your memory database if you were only allowed to memorize the experiences that you had without any location, without any sense of location being included whatsoever? Suddenly you're empty. You have no memories because you've never practiced this before. Or maybe you have recently, or maybe, maybe you have. You see, location generates the soul out of the universal soul. So to return to the universal soul, we need to drop location. So notice location, notice the sense of it. And the more clearly you surround it with your consciousness, the more clearly you perceive of location, the easier it is to give it away, to turn the other way. Imagine what it would be like without any sense of location. Go to the existence, the sense of I is, the sense of God is, or existence is. free of any imagination, any sense of having a location, of having a body, of having a mind, of having a life. Your life is all based inside of a container of space and time. Who are you without space and time? It's relatively easy for people to see that they're not their thoughts. It's relatively easy for people to see that they're not their body, although even though they say that, 
they usually continue to go on forever believing that they are the body, even when they've had sufficient spiritual practice. You know, I'm not the body. I know that I'm not the body. I'm a unicorn spirit or something, something else. But really, it's all conceptual until we start getting to the very core sense of I am the body inside of this location, and we start to examine this very, very carefully. We start to investigate and penetrate and perforate and release and release and release and shed. I'm not this. I'm not this. I'm not this sensation. I'm not this imagination. I'm not this location. I am not this body. I'm not this mind. I'm not this sensation, etc., etc., etc. And as we keep giving and rejecting everything, keep giving away and rejecting everything that we can perceive, we get closer and closer and closer to the naked state of the supreme perceiver itself, the universal perceiver, the I is, God. It's light as bliss. Awareness of pure being, pure being, not just awareness of being. Awareness of pure being, meaning distilled from location, free of space-time, free of body, the I am without the body, not the I am over here looking at you guys. No, the I am without the figment of your imagination called being over here looking at you guys. If I drop that, which I do every time I go to deep sleep or whenever I choose to do so, but you have that same experience every time you enter deep sleep or even when you enter the dream world, your space-time reality completely changes. Your identity changes. Your sense of where you are, who you are, changes. Now, especially in deep sleep, all of that is gone, but there is still existence. If you can get to know that existence while you're awake, you can develop the capacity to let more of God's light through your vehicles, or bodies, if you will. And so bliss is as simple as giving up your life. or at least all attachment to it. Now it's tough to give up attachment to your life when you're so engaged with it. So we need breaks. We need interruptions. We need moments where it's just God. You can't do this if you have hopes and desires and attachment to outcome running all over the place. So you've got to develop a, a method to very quickly, succinctly, for those periods of time that you would call meditation or contemplation or penetration or marination, for you to get through those layers of dispelling any sense of desire and outcome and separate identity. And so to do so, again, the first step is to stop demanding, needing, or wanting anything from anything. Even if you've had an extremely busy day and you've been so empowered and following your dreams and all that stuff, if you sit down and all you repeat to yourself is, I don't want anything from this experience, and then the next experience gets registered or shows up as an appearance inside of your awareness, but it's loud enough for you to notice it. Maybe it's a sensation in the body. Maybe it's a thought of your loved ones. Maybe it's a thought of the things you still have to do. Maybe it's the thought, oh, I don't want to sit down and meditate, which you're not. It's just the body doing it. You're that which the body is trying to get to when it's meditating. So just witness the body trying to remember you. So you sit down, and all you do is vibrationally continue to assert to any and all appearances that are registrable to you, I don't want anything from this. Make yourself smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until you slip through the cracks of physical reality and you become like a subatomic energy particle surrounded by nothing but infinite space. You can't even see the next subatomic rotational field. It's, you're so tiny that you have no arms, no legs, nothing to grasp with. You have no mind. You fall into emptiness and then you can drop that subatomic particle too. Just become the void if you want to. Bottom line is that if you continue to reassert that I don't need, want, or desire anything from anything, and you continue to do that, if you do this with high deliberateness, with high desire, with high earnestness, it only takes five minutes, if that, to completely calm the mind. It becomes quiet. 
that which is running the show all the time, the operator that's hiding inside of your gray mask, seemingly, that thinks it's got all the controls in life, it dies, it disappears. Why? Because the fuel that sustains your mind, that sustains your sense of being separate, is desire. I'm not saying desire is bad, it has its applications. But for the purpose of this exercise, you want to eradicate all desire. To really come into the light of God, the total fulfillment of self. To know self, instead of, you know, usually all we know is not self. We think we know everything that is, but actually none of that has isness. It's all references. It's all empty references. So the myth of existing, things existing, when we actually investigate and we go direct and experiential, we find that none of the things we're ever in relationship with actually have existence. It's not a nihilistic view, by the way. It simply replaces the lack of existence with existence. It starts to fill up your entire field of consciousness with a sense of uniform beingness, sense of unified beingness, of non-duality, of light, of love, of God, of pure isness without boundaries, without separation. But only if you drop in. So for five minutes, with high desire, ironically, keep reasserting that you don't want anything from anything. Make your only desire to not have, harbor, cultivate, entertain any notion of any desire of anything pleasing you or displeasing you. You have no preferences, no demands. Your body feels like shit, you don't care. You don't even have arms, minds, or fingers, or feet, or legs, or whatever appendages you normally grasp with. You have none of these to grasp with. become smaller and smaller and smaller, more and more and more insignificant. And in that simplicity, you will find that the ego starts to unwind itself very rapidly. There's nothing quite like step one in terms of getting to that state, which is already a very high state, and it's only step one. The state of not wanting anything from anything, total acceptance, where you are not existent as a separate entity, you become the field of clear seeing, clear awareness, clear present viewing. Because you have no demands, it's that simple. You're simply not running around trying to get something or trying to avoid something you don't like. You become, naturally, because this is your, this is your natural state, you become the vision itself, you become view. Rather than a point of view, you become the view, which contains the points of view. But it's no longer distracted. It no longer believes it is one of these points of view. So the biases disappear. They arise and they are decharged, so to speak. They are unwound. Keep doing this, keep doing this, keep doing this, and you will reach a very quiescent state, a very beautiful state of equilibrium. Peace. Many call this enlightenment, and it is. It's just the first stage of it. Now, to go deeper, what we want to do is notice the subtle, mental, contextual, imaginative containers that are still present in our experience, that still bind us to being here now. So now we're the pure view, but we're still looking at this life from this particular point of view. We're still the soul that's present to this particular life, but now our field of vision is clear, which is a great advancement. But it's still very limited. It's filled with much more transparency and love coming from the deeper levels of that non-dual state of God, God's light, God's isness. Nevertheless, you will still notice there's a sense of location. There's a sense of me talking, you listening. So it's finite, it's very finite. You take up so many square, cubic square inches or meters or feet, but you're not the isness that pervades everything. But you can start to notice it from this clear state, intuitively. 
So he, this is where step two comes in, is ignore all acts of seeing. Why? Because seeing and seeing things have become so synonymous for us. In other words, seeing, the act of seeing, the sheer act of clear seeing, even if it's clear, clear of desires and personalities, that clear seeing is still associated with location. I'm seeing from over here. It's a very subtle assumption. You don't see from over here. But even saying that, you'll be scratching your head. If I say, you're not seeing from over there. Like, wait, no, I am. Because it's a subtle assumption. It's a subtle belief. It's an uninvestigated assumption that has run your life and it has ruined your life. So it, you can unruin your life by ignoring all acts of seeing. What happens is that it's not really that we toss away awareness, not yet, but it's that awareness by simply giving up any and all sense or acts of seeing things, that the world of objects and subject-object duality starts to fade away and disappear. The identification that we have with the individual seer of the scene or the subject of all the objects of content in our lives. That core sense that we always bring to the equation that we so, so rarely, even in spiritual circles, investigate when we're active. We'll be having a dialogue and we're totally blurting out our assumption of being an individual separate entity that's seeing from over here, looking at others over there, talking about really clear concepts but really not being clear at all. Right? So we want to become clear actually clear. In order to do that, we need to transcend the seer of the seen, which is the same thing. You've only ever seen something as the seer. So the seer and the seen has always arisen together simultaneously as one. They seem to be separate because of the sense of location, which is merely visual imagination. Without visual imagination, where's the sense of location? So you see the knower and the known are always arising simultaneously. That's what I call the I am. The, them together is the I am, the individual experience of being here now. We want to get beyond the I am. Being the I am is already great. It's much better than being the body or the person. So by all means, rest in the I am as a practice. But you want to go beyond the I am. You want to know the formless state of pure awareness, which is its only true state, because awareness is pure and formless. Can you find a form to awareness? Something knows that your body is hearing my voice right now. So awareness is not the body hearing my voice, it's that which knows that your body is hearing my voice. There's different levels of being the hearer or the seer or the knower. The body is one vehicle of perception. But you're beyond all that. That which knows that you are, within which the body is projected, within which the senses are perceiving other vibratory emanations, such as my voice, and then they're relaying all that. But there is a field, if you will, a background, if you will, this is just so your mind can grasp it, but a background, quote-unquote background, of awareness that is effortlessly aware of my voice even when you're not paying attention. You might be half dosed of and nevertheless there is an awareness that's always here observing, noticing, registering whatever experience is going on. Can you notice that? Can you find any shape to this awareness? Now it might come with the sensation, for example, oh yeah, it's the background, it's right like 10 inches behind my head. Or, yeah, it's up there. Or, yeah, it's this vast field. But you see, those need imagination. Those are still filters. That's not God in its original state. That's God with an I am. That's God with the sense of location. That's God with mental containers confining it. What I'm talking about is getting to know the light of God in its pure, original, formless form. The great, original thought of infinite love, light, consciousness. 
the one being in all beings, in all appearances. That awareness has no form. Whenever form comes up, discard it, but maintain awareness. Another form might come up, a subtler form. Maybe now your space instead of inside the body. Good for you. Toss space out of the window too, but maintain awareness. Become more and more blind to the world of form. Continue to unsee everything. Unsee, unsee, unsee. Ignore all acts of seeing. This is powerful stuff. This is subtle stuff. Requires practice, a little bit of understanding. Continue to toss out, continue to reject any act of seeing that arises to your consciousness. And you will find that the beingness that remains is being clarified, like ghee, clarified butter. Purify yourself, purify the I am from the I am this, or I am here, or I am now, or I am then. Any addition to pure, simple, beingness, awareness, bliss needs to go. If you want to know yourself as God. You don't have to, obviously. But that's what I teach right now. So. <laughs> When we give up all acts of seeing, awareness goes back to its natural, formless, pure state of knowing itself as the pure knowingness underlying subject-object reality. The pure isness, awareness, bliss. So it's like awareness, instead of looking in to its mental containers, its projections of form and the world and the body and location and space-time, instead of seeing all that mind stuff, when it ignores or deletes or trashes all the mind stuff, or rejects it, that awareness will collapse back onto itself and what will remain is the self shining purely as itself, the true self, the God self, awareness, aware of its own beingness, of its own isness. The result is bliss. Unless it's still very much tied into location. Well, that's great. Awareness is over there. I can recognize the quality of awareness. But really, I am this body and I've got tons of trouble to fix right now. Things to work through. A journey to be had. So it's about shifting from being the person recognizing awareness to being awareness, being able to recognize the person when you choose to. It's a profound shift. It's not for everyone, but you can do it. And this is one of the most direct ways I have found to establish this experientially. Again, this is about actual spirituality, not the fluffy kind you find everywhere. This is actual God realization, if you practice. Now that we're at the level of being, I'm going somewhat fast, and I know that for the newcomers this might be a little bit much, but. Um, that's because you weren't here before. And so uh, a lot of people here were here before. So again, go to bentinyamasara.tv and just watch all the sessions and it's very progressive, uh, progressional, you know, stage one, stage two, stage three, so that every detail of this can be experienced and isolated and experienced so that by the end of it, which is today, maybe you can just download it, you know, like Trinity that this is all clear to you. You can navigate this yourself, independent from having to be here or having to read this. It just becomes more and more fluid and intuitive. That's the goal. But it requires you to know the content, to understand what's, what this points to, and then to apply it experientially. But the results are epic. So go do it. It's my recommendation. So now what we're left with is we're going to take it one step further. We're going to go beyond God. Okay, so those that are new here, take a breath, breathe a deep breath, relax, come into the now. When we ignore all acts of seeing, awareness collapses back onto pure beingness. This pure beingness is, from a more absolute point of view, the only truth. Everything else is mental projection, which lacks independent isness. You can think of a tree out there, but where's the isness in that thought? 
the isness is in the heart, so to speak, the core, the beingness. So you can always either shift to the sense of beingness, the pure existence, or you can be thinking about things and lack existence or lack awareness of true existence. Thinking that the things you think about are real, but actually upon investigation, in comparison to resting in the existence state, they are not real. They have no reality. Only existence is. Thought is not. Only existence is. And it expresses itself as thought, but the things you think about have no isness. Only isness has isness. And thoughts about things do not come with a sense of isness. You are. That is isness. You are God. Now strip the you are from all the mental containers you've added over your lifetime, and you go back into the pure state of infinite peace, bliss, love, capacity, endurance, empowerment. It's all there. It's all inside of your existence. All you have to do is give up what's not self and believing it is self so that the true self can shine forth and be known. Rest in God. Rest in God. Rest in God. Give up your life. Give up your life. It's futile. It doesn't get anywhere. It doesn't go anywhere. Give up your life. Give up your life. It's not important. It's not significant. You are not important. When you realize you're not important, that's when the light of God starts to transform you, like inner alchemy. And that light of God now starts to purge all the impurities very quickly, much quicker than you ever could, tinkering with this and tinkering with that and doing this practice and that practice and going through this process. Trust me, you'll die as miserable as you are today. And you are miserable, whether you know that or not. Compared to the state of God, you are miserable. So it depends on what you truly desire. If you want to go fast and direct, or if you want to go slow and have your little kick and your vanity, but realize that at the end of your life, you die. You don't take any of that ego with you anyway. Nobody gives a fuck what you did in your life. And so there you are, as if you were never born. But while you were alive, you were giving so much importance to all this stuff that had no isness. It didn't exist. This whole time, it did not exist. And you made it so, so, so important. And you wrapped it around yourself and called it you. Very painful. Very painful, very humiliating. <laughs> innocent, innocent, but humiliating. <laughs> Especially when you die, you're like, oh, fuck. I wish I had, if only I saw, if only I knew. It's innocent, but it's still a form of complete arrogance. It's just self-obsession. So only isness has isness. It's really that simple. This is one of my simplest statements and the most profound ones. Only isness has isness. Just ponder, ponder it until you get it. It means two things mostly. Only isness has isness. It, it just eliminates everything. It's like, oh, okay. Well, do I want to be focused so much in things that lack existence, that lack reality? Or do I wish to be reality and know reality and see through reality and experience and taste reality and channel reality? If I do, then I have to understand that only that which has isness has isness or reality or existence. Therefore, suddenly your whole life becomes reprioritized. Instead of focusing all the thoughts that you focus on every day, you start to notice how they are empty, how they lack any isness. And when you are in a state of clearly seeing that all your thoughts lack isness, you are naturally aware of pure isness. It's like it just pervades your thoughts. It's like a light shining 
through the transparent level, the now transparent level of thinking. The thinking mind, sure, it has its practical values, but it all involves a world that has no isness. The world doesn't have isness, you see. Only isness has isness. This means that in order to know what is, you need to go to that which you can notice directly in your experience as having isness. So I'm going to ask you, in your direct experience now, what is it that has isness? Just experience that. Experience the isness within your heart, so to speak, your metaphysical heart, the core, the essence, the beingness of your being. Notice isness, that which actually is, that which actually has existence, the sense of existence. You notice? Isness. Only that is real. Then you go back to thinking and thinking that I'm up here speaking to you and whoop, delusion is back. I have no isness. You have no isness. Only isness has isness. It's very humbling because there's none of you there. None of us are there. And none of your personality, none of your history exists in isness. That's because none of your history exists. None of it has isness. Only isness has isness. It's very, very humbling. That's why it's not for everybody. Because it eradicates very swiftly all the delusions of a separate self that we've cultivated for so long and protected for so long. So now all of our self-taught mechanisms for self-defense and standing up for oneself and all the thoughts that we need to feel good about ourselves, all that stuff starts disappearing. And it's a beautiful clearing if you're ready for it. But it's disastrous if you're not. You'll scream and shout and resist and hurt. But if you're ready for it, it's delicious because it's like the river ending in the ocean, realizing there were no rivers to begin with. There was only the ocean. There is only God. You are not. Because you is a concept. It's not pure isness. Only isness has existence. So go to the isness state and make it purer and purer and purer and purer. Shed it from all mental containers of space, time, location, body, sensation, story, who you are, where you're going. Until isness starts shining of its own accord, freely, automatically, naturally, because you have become transparent to that which is. You have undermined the you. That's the recognizer of isness. And so now there's a harmony happening throughout the levels of consciousness so that isness, God, God's light shines forth through those different layers and vehicles without any identity stuck in any one of those vehicles any longer. You have dissolved. Now there's only God operating based on relevance and benefit and service. It takes you out of the equation your sense of you, which is based on a thought. And a thought has no isness, therefore you do not exist. This is more profound than just a concept. I'm not saying you don't exist and you go, oh yeah, okay, great, I don't exist. No, this is a real seeing, you know? It's not that Neo-Advaita kind of philosophical mindfuck. It's real. This is real. It's about you dissolving into God, not into a concept that you don't exist. That would just be another concept. This is about getting beyond all concepts by realizing that no concept has existence. It's just, it's a fraud. It's a big, big joke. None of your thoughts have isness. But you can check this out. Check it out for yourself. Be Alice in Wonderland. Does this thought have isness? No, only isness. I, I is. That deep, profound, intuitive sense of I is or I am beyond form. Only that I am is. Nothing else is. It also quiets the mind. Because then what are you going to think about? <laughs> <laughs> Unless you prefer non-reality over reality. Unless you prefer the things that don't exist 
over that which does exist, which is the state of delusion, which is what keeps us so bound. And yeah. Anyway, that's good for now. Okay, so now we're going to take it one step further so you can forget everything I just said. <laughs> so when we unsee everything, what remains is pure isness. Makes sense, right? Now that we've spoken about this and been guided through this. So go to the sense of pure isness. And if you haven't had a lot of experience with it, you might have to just use imagination in considering that this isness is the substratum, it's the light. It's the formless light that never leaves itself, that always shines as all things. Everythingness, the entire universe, infinite universes, are made out of the I which is, which shines in the very heart of your being. That which alone has isness. Nothing else is. Only isness is. Only you are. Only God is. Rest in that state. Make this your practice. Rest in that state. Rest in that state. Rest in that state. Let your delusions drop away one by one by one by one by one by one. Until you become naked and pure and bliss starts to take over. Again, bliss comes in when location goes out. The more location goes, the more identity disappears and the more true and only identity arises, which is Satchidananda, or God's light, God's isness. Rest in that state, rest in that state, go deeper, deeper, more and more naked, more and more profound. Know yourself as God, formless God, which does not perceive a world. It only perceives that it is. But that becomes all-pervading. That's what remains after the first two steps. And so the third step is to ignore or go beyond being. So we rest as beingness. I always love this part when there's new people because it's confusing and it's fun. <laughs> so, <laughs> yay! When we, when isness remains, then isness needs to go. Because what you truly are is before God. Now, there's not many that expound this realization, but it can be found. It has been realized throughout history. Um, it's just very, very uncommon. And so this will sound very paradoxical, but it's the truth. You don't have to believe that, but it is still the truth, even if you don't believe it. And that is that before any sense of isness arose, you were still there. Before God became, before beingness arose, the absolute, one, infinite, indescribable, ingraspable you already existed without needing any sense of existing. You are before creation. You are before beingness. So now that you're resting in pure beingness, and because you've given up your wants of this world, for at least for the duration of this meditation, you don't want anything from anything, then clear seeing remains, then you give up all acts of seeing, and seeing collapses back into pure being, and becomes more and more naked. That pure beingness is God, formless awareness, beingness, bliss. You deepen in that, you enjoy the bliss of that, and the more you practice being aware of Satchidananda, of existence, consciousness, bliss, or God's isness, the more aware you become of isness, the more aware you become that you are before isness. What is it that's aware of isness? That is you. But it's not the you you know. It's the you where there is no identity, where there is perfection, completion, absolute, infinite indescribability. You can pop out of beingness 
and understand that you're the witness of beingness. You're the identityless one, infinite absolute, on top of which there's a friction created by the appearance of beingness. That friction can be known, can be observed as I am. But it's just an effect. It's an effect of the creation appearing in absolute, infinite, indescribable formlessness. It's more empty than emptiness. It's more formless than formlessness. It doesn't have any quality. You have no quality. God has a quality. How can God be absolute if it has a quality? Something that already has a definition, something that already is, cannot possibly create anything. You are that which is witness to God. God cannot witness you. It can only function as the mirror so that God can see, sorry, that the absolute can see itself in the mirror that we call God or beingness. The more pristinely aware you are trained in being aware of being, pure beingness, the easier it becomes to see that actually beingness is the first, only, and final distortion of the one absolute. It's the first, only, and final concept, delusion, creation, appearance. Beingness is not the subject, it's actually just another object. God is another appearance. On top of that which can never appear, the absolute. It can never make itself known. It can never arise and say, look at me, here I am, this is me, the absolute. Anything that has any appearance that can be known is part of the God state of isness. You are before God. God does not know you. You know God. God's only heard tales of your existence. Myths, mysteries by great seers or unseers. But God is still scratching its head because it cannot quite fathom something beyond itself. Only the Absolute can realize itself in the mirror of God. That's why it created God so it can know itself. Because in its own infinite Absolute state there is no contrast, there is no friction. Without friction there is no work, there is no awareness, there is no reflection. So awareness is the product of the first creation being isness, love, light, Awareness is that intelligence which governs it, but which also has the unique capacity to wake up from it and function as a bridge between the Absolute and its creation, or its isness, its beingness, its God. God is the first, only, and final concept. There is no other concept. All concepts are the one beingness. You are that on top of which all this appears but which itself can never appear to any of it. It's more absolute than the void, though we could call it the void if we wanted to. But let's not. Let's call it the absolute. It's absolute. It's indescribable. It's the great indescribability. It's the unappointability. It's the inexperienceable. It's that which is forever and ever and ever and always and in all ways beyond experiencing. You are that which can never be experienced. How are you going to realize that? You can't use any of the tools you're used to using. That's why I say this is a very realization. Because even self-realization at the level of knowing yourself as God, as profound as that is, as beautiful as that is, it's still an experience. An experience can never be the absolute. Because where did that experience come from? Something more absolute than the experience. So where did the experience of God come from? Where did that pure self-experiencing, the self-experiencing itself, where did that come from? What enables that quality, that first, only, and final quality? The quality of existence, awareness, bliss. You are before that. You're older than God.
even isness has never touched you. Even pure beingness has never affected you, touched you, caressed you. There's no contact. Isness cannot reach you. It sounds empty and nihilistic, but when you realize it, it's the most liberating thing. Because now nothing in existence can touch you. Because you have realized that what you are is beyond existence. Who's ever going to put a gun to that head? Everything that ever happens, happens inside of existence. If existence does not even affect what you are, then how can anything inside of existence affect you? <coughs> Slip through the cracks of existence into the void where there is a distance between the true absolute you and the isness beingness creation that appears in front of your absolute facelessness. In that distance, in that void, one may realize the absolute, infinite, perfect, incomprehensible, formless, truly formless. Even God, as formless as it is at its most absolute state, still has the form of isness. That's still a form. It doesn't have any shape, it doesn't have a location, but it's still a form. It's still a concept, it still is something that is, cannot create isness. The higher always creates the lower. The denser always comes from the more vast, the subtler. What's subtler than God? Question mark. Rest in the question mark. What is beyond consciousness? What's beyond pure consciousness? Pure consciousness came on top of your being, your true being, which is not being. The true absolute you. One day it was just there. Awareness. And then suddenly you had to carry all these burdens. And like maintain an entire universe somehow. God. What if you could be free of even that? The responsibility of having to be. What if you don't have to be? What if you can know yourself free of being? It's like you're a walking void. You start wearing black stuff <laughs> without thinking of it. All the colors go, you become really, really serious. No, you don't become serious. You become quite the opposite as a vehicle expression. And the Absolute doesn't deny that any of this appears. It's not in denial. It doesn't need to deny this in order to know itself once it knows itself. But initially, you might have to go through a phase of rejection of your personal life because it's become so ingrained as your identity. The One Absolute has filtered down through infinite awareness, then through the location of a soul, then through the denser location of a particular physical life, then through the filters of mind and psychology, and I'm unworthy, and my daddy abused me, and whatever else it is that's going on. And so now that's what you know. And when I stub my toe, it fucking hurts. So that's me hurting because of the fucking stone that's over there. And I didn't see it, didn't pay attention. I need another class to be more mindful. I need to go on a spiritual journey. This is the absolute at its most lost state. Okay, that's you, <laughs> me, you, whatever. But those steps can be retraced. And then suddenly this expression starts to make sense. You know, the expression of why you're here, that kind of stuff. And you can now engage in these questions you can now engage in this, in this journey of expansion and expression and crystallization of your unique desire and intention for being here without the sting of taking it too seriously and without the sting of making concepts feel real to you. Without that, you know the difference? Someone who's realized the void, when they're talking about a story, they know it's not true. They're just telling the story because it has some relevance to another context. But it's empty of a center point. It's empty of an observer. It's empty of a subject to whom that story belongs. 
even when they're talking about themselves, even when they're talking about their body and what happened to their body that day and how their emotional body is feeling as a reflection of others mostly at that point. Even when all that is shared, it's, there's always an awareness of the void. There's always an awareness of how it has no substance. It has no beingness. How even isness is a joke. Now, if isness is a joke, then for sure any story you can come up with must be a joke. Because even God doesn't exist. It just appears. Even God is an appearance. You know what an appearance is, right? It appears. It has no beingness. It, ha it lacks all substance, any and all foundation. There is no foundation to whatever appears. If something can appear, it's not real. It doesn't have beingness. If something appears consistently, it starts to generate a self sense, a sense of self. Beingness arises. But really, ultimately, when you see from the void, you see that all appearances lack beingness. And thus, when you share a story, it's just it's not real. There's, it doesn't belong to you. Even when it belongs to you, it doesn't belong to you. Even the you that's still there doesn't belong to you. Even that's not taken as real. It changes everything, as you can imagine. And the deeper you allow yourself to drop into this, as is relevant for you, the more you become the void, the one infinite, the terror in the veil of the matrix of creation. You become a walking void. You become like a portal. That's why I said a couple weeks ago, if you value your life as it is structured currently, don't hang out with me too much. And that's a serious, serious warning, without it being serious, but it's a sincere warning. As much as you would like to hang out, just don't. Unless you like to hang out more than you like your life, then it's safe, then we can hang out. But who would like to hang out more than that they like their life or are attached to their life? No? Those are the real adepts. And so that's where the real work is done. That's where the real transformation happens. Sweet. Um, so this was sort of a summary of the last season, in a way. I still recommend, if you're new, that you, and even if you're old, that you <laughs> go through the first season again, just to get that catch-up thing. And again, you don't have to wait once a week. Uh, it, you know, it's all available now, so you can more or less binge watch it or watch a couple episodes per night or one a day or something. So in a single week you can be caught up in that sense and like have a refresher and be potently realized in this. Because next season I don't know exactly what I'm going to be uh, sharing yet. It might be a more alchemized um, blend of self-realization and self-actualization. But for that to be successful it would be really helpful for you to have a firm foundation in self-realization. That's why I recommend that season one is one of your priorities when it comes to your spiritual practice. Um, more so than the crystal shops in Sedona. <laughs> Actually practice. <laughs> you laugh, but it's really, really... <laughs> Sooner or later, everyone's going to have to make the choice whether they want their spirituality to be conceptual or real. And it's very simple. When it's real, it becomes very unfluffy. It becomes very direct. It becomes very practical. It becomes very authentic. It becomes very without any bells and whistles. It's just direct, direct, direct experience, going back to the true self. And then you start seeing that all these other things were mainly distractions, and some of them were helpful, temporary permission slips to go deeper, but most of them were distractions. But at that point, you want this anyway. Otherwise, you wouldn't choose it or see it. And then whatever your passions are, your passions will also become more direct, will become more infused with a, a very powerful directness and willingness. And I don't quite know how to describe it, but everything empowers itself, everything in your life. 
So you don't have to worry because everything that's a true, genuine inspiration from your soul into this life will remain and only amplify itself. Um, but there's things that will fall away, things that were just distractions and placeholders and permission slips that no longer serve you when you choose to make your spirituality actual instead of conceptual. And what's a concept? Everything, except the self, except that which is. So it doesn't leave a lot of room for a lot of paths, you know, a lot of like things. And you still do these, but you realize, you start realizing that they are inherently empty and that all meaning is self-given. Even the crystals are empty of meaning. They are <coughs> given meaning. Doesn't mean they can't be helpful. They have many applications. But that's because we've given them that meaning and those properties, ultimately. For thousands of years, for millions of years, as being crystal, we've been giving it that property. But still, all that is very relative compared to pure existence. All that is still conceptual when compared to the more absolute states of realization. So it really just depends on to what degree you desire this. And you will find it comes in waves, comes and goes in waves. Then you go into self-realization, and then you feel a wave of expressing yourself in a certain way and tuning your life up a little bit, upgrading it or changing it or um, crystallizing yourself in a certain way, learning certain lessons, engaging in certain relationships to learn certain specifics. And then there's a period where you throw it out, all throw it out, throw it all out. And then you come back into the light of God, and that deepens and that purifies all that you've learned. And then you express again from an even purer, brighter, lighter, more transparent state. And the emptier that you come, the more empty you become. <coughs> the more empty you become, the more of a shepherd you become. The more of service you become naturally. The higher your endurance as well. Your capacity for experiencing things without getting fooled by them. You know, we only need the amount of breaks that we do because of how distracting illusion still is to us. If we're really rooted in the void, then we rarely need any time to ourselves, if any, because there's no such thing as time to yourself. It's an illusion, it's self-protection, it's enclosing. This whole sense of protecting your space and your time and your schedule, the only purpose that has in serving is a self that doesn't exist. I'm sure you have to balance that out because as long as you still feel and assume and believe at the deeper subconscious levels of yourself that you are that individual, you will have to need to take care of it. The less you believe you are that individual, the more it's taken care of for you and you don't have to worry. You just flow and things amp up. And opportunity to be of service increases because you're now being called upon. Every, every person in creation senses has this sixth sense that they're not even aware of of those that are sort of holes in the fabric of the matrix. And this exists at different levels, but you'll be sought out. You'll be in high demand energetically, and situations will come to you that only you can solve and only you can see and recognize. They'll be attracted to you because it becomes increasingly more rare to have a being that has that capacity to take care of those kinds of paradoxes. It becomes more and more paradoxical. Your life becomes more and more paradoxical, less and less about you, and if you're still holding on to self-image whatsoever, you can forget about it. It'll get shredded. So, it's not for everyone, but yet it is, because it is what you are, you know? You want to take it at your own pace, but at the same time, you don't want to take my pace too seriously, because where does that come from? Self-protection. And that self-protection only encapsulates you and keeps you contained in your sense of location and your individual separate life. And it doesn't allow you the power and the bliss and the love and the joy that you seek and avoid knowing yourself. The truth. Are there any questions um, or explorations or sharings since this is the last meeting of the season? I have, I have quite a few, but... Okay, um, and, uh, you are new here today, yes. is that correct? Okay, so there is a chance that I will say I won't answer your question. Okay. And just don't take that personally, or do. Okay. But it's not meant personally. Um, the first question, or the most important question to me, is when one's awareness passes away... Sorry, can you hold it closer? I'm sorry, when one's awareness passes away, 
in death, what level uh, do does someone you know, I, I do they go to the absolute? Mm, rarely, no. Um, awareness doesn't disappear though. Awareness doesn't die. Just the vehicle that you chose for this life disappears from view. But it's like waking up from a dream, very much so. Like when you wake up from a dream, you remember that, oh, this is my real life. Let's say you had a nightmare, which most of you are having now, even though it, <laughs> <laughs> Even when it seems kind of good, our tolerance for suffering is so insane that you know, if you ask someone, how are you doing, when they're doing total shit, they'll say, like, yeah, no, it's okay. It's like, <laughs> I can't complain. So if anything, God really appreciates our tolerance and endurance for suffering. Because if you compare this to other realities that many of you instinctually remember, and some very consciously remember, um, you know, this is what most people create for themselves. Not this inherently, but what people create by their definitions and their meanings is kind of hellish. Anyway. So when the vehicle dies, all these definitions disappear, or at least the attachment to the definitions disappear, and there is a period of review, if you will. There is a learning of that life. Um, kind of like when you went to watch a movie, and after you go out, you know, you talk about it with your friends. In this case, your friends are the higher self, your higher self, so to speak. Um, but you review this life, and, and you extract as much learning from it that you can after it's already been lived, at which point actions can no longer be corrected. Um, but acceptance and forgiveness of self and other self can still occur and often needs to occur, especially in the way that we've set up creation. There's a lot of healing and acceptance and forgiveness that happens uh, post-death experience. Um, what was your question? Uh, um, I lost a son, and so that is something very... I'm searching, and so... His awareness now, you said that we were before God. So does that mean, I, I thought he went back to God, but now he went back to the absolute. You don't I, even I, go back to God. It's very, rare for, um, it's very rare for someone who passes on to go back to God, the God state. Everything is God, right? But the original God state, let alone the absolute. What we're talking about in terms of realizing the absolute is actually where the oversoul realizes its own demise, its own end, it has completed itself. It becomes the awareness of all things, and then finally it disappears beyond even that. Like the awareness of all things is the completion state, but then all that collapses back into a metaphysical black hole where all of that disappears into the one infinite, original, timeless, formless, without beingness. So we're talking about a very, very late state of the soul's development, like way beyond this life and beyond other evolutionary densities. Um, so what's most probable, it's not that none of these things will be influencing that state, like we'll have more awareness of the God state or of our connectedness to God in the state after we die, uh, because the veil of this density falls away. And so our awareness is more expanded, we remember who we are, like you, when you wake up from a dream, it's like, oh yeah, this is where I live. I live in Sedona. This is my life. It feels more real than your dream did most often, right? So that felt like a temporary story and you wake up into this life and um, whether the dream was better or not will depend on whether you like this. But it will feel more real, like, oh yeah, this is my life. I remember now. But in the dream, you forgot, mm -hmm. right? Same with this life, you forget what you are. When you die, you remember. After a while, there's a process there too. Um, so when that remembrance comes back in, one is back in touch with the higher self and one can see from a more overview perspective all the different extensions and the lives and the balances and the imbalances that that particular soul still needs to work out. And so that's really the nature of karma. It's, it's self-given. It's free will. It's simply you seeing that, hey, there's an imbalance here, there's something I want to learn, so let me have this particular experience, which will be conducive to generating catalysts, which allows me to wake up from a particular angle of being blind slash seeing, that allows me to balance out these things at a soul level. So everything you do here contributes to the balance of your soul, or the imbalance of your soul, right? Um, so his, quote unquote, his awareness, um, is 
most likely, most probably. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what he's up to now. I mean, like it's it's parallel realities, right? It's parallel right. lives all the time. Uh, all your parallel extensions are happening. So time is a very weird concept to talk about after death. Um, it only makes sense from our space-time container to talk about time in a linear way. Uh, but he is spirit. He always is spirit or higher selves, having different place and extensions at different levels of his consciousness. So his consciousness doesn't, didn't disappear, but the particular crystallization and denseness of his consciousness in this particular realm, his psychology, his psychological consciousness is gone. But it still exists as an imprint or as a memory. You know, I think, it's still available. But. I think my confusion is, is that I had not before today heard the concept that we were before the existence of God. Uh -huh. And so that's where immediately I thought of my son Jimmy. Well, then where, where is he? <laughs> and if well, we he, if, if we're looking at this level of the absolute, then he is not, nor, nor are you. And it doesn't matter whether you live, whether you die, whether you're at a very high level or a very low level, whether you know God or not God. As the absolute, there's nobody. There's only the absolute, and that's what we are right now. So he is not the absolute. The absolute is the absolute. If he's still here, then he considers himself to be other than the absolute. If he realizes that he is not, fundamentally is not, not just as a personality ego, but as the ego of the oversoul, if he realizes at that level that even the oversoul beingness, that even the beingness of all of creation is not, then he is the absolute or the absolute is him, which is already the case. It's just not realized. Does that make sense? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I'll let somebody else have the mic. Okay. I, have, I, I, I have a lot to process. Well, in that case, has there been anybody who has, after leaving this physicality, gone to that absolute state, like Buddha? Again, no, again nobody goes there. That's the irony. The way you are already there, yeah. but it's not that you are there. The absolute is. Yeah. You are not. It's a, it's a different realization. So nobody goes there. Like, there's no, there's no way you can go there. <laughs> there's a thousand ways to roam, but there is no way to the absolute. <laughs> so then why do we, uh, then why do we uh, seek the absolute? Because it's the truth, and this is not. It's like when you're dreaming, and you start to know that you're dreaming, you want to see so clearly that while you're dreaming, you know that you're just dreaming and that none of the dream has any real substance. It's just appearance. So you're right now, you're in the realm of appearance, but you have this deep core assumption that you exist. If you can get rid of the assumption that you exist, the absolute will naturally know itself because that's all there is. There is no God. There is no world. There is no universe. There is no evolution. There is no individualization. Okay, so one last question. If that is all true, and I do believe that, um, then where did Christ go or Buddha go? Well, it depends on their level of consciousness so, and what their purpose was. So when I die, quote unquote, I will go to whatever is relevant for me to continue to express or explore if that is relevant. Um, if that completely, truly is not relevant, then I'll simply disappear, so to speak, or you could say my awareness becomes the awareness of all that is, and beyond that, all that is merges back into the one infinite absolute. So would you elaborate on Tathagat? The what? The Tathagat, meaning the, the enlightened being that chooses to stay back for humanity like Buddha, they say of Buddha. Right. Yeah, what about it? There's a term called Tathagat. Which is it the same as the Bodhisattva? Yeah. Okay. Would you elaborate on that? I mean, it, it's like going into the absolute and it doesn't need to come back, but he chooses to come back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Would you please elaborate a little bit on that?
when I use the term shepherding consciousness, again, I reserve that for the very highest meaning, one who has emptied themselves of the core of ego and self-interest is synonymous with bodhisattva. And so my intention is, or one of the intentions that flows through my vehicle is to generate more bodhisattvas because I think that's what would be helpful here on earth, so to speak. So that's what this uh, teaching is designed to do or can do. Of course, it's up to your free will and what's relevant for you. But even for people to have a little bit more of that capacity to be a mirror rather than to be a distortion in the mirror is helpful is desirable, highly desirable. And like I said, you'll be sought out when this is true, when it's no longer just about you gaining your self-worth through your spiritual practice and your spiritual exuberance. When it's genuine, when really all you live for is service to others. There's no other reason. And any time that there is no service to others, you start wondering why you're here because there's no other reason. Mundane reality just feels absolutely irrelevant of your attention and so the only thing that excites you or motivates you or fuels you is opportunity for expansion opportunity for benefit opportunity for collective awakening or individual awakening because if one wakes up deeply enough it affects the whole so sometimes I spend weeks on one person um, intensely because I sense that the effects of that particular entity will have ripple effects that are much greater than I could ever do holding a retreat for those two weeks, for example. So that happens too. If one wakes up profoundly enough, all wake up more. So yeah, create a little army of uh, bodhisattvas. <laughs> and they all live in Sedona. That would be pretty cool. <laughs> which is the bodhisattva vortex of the earth because everything that happens here will affect the balance of the entire grid. So we're at the bodhisattvic um, city or location on earth, so to speak, right here. So we create a lot of bodhisattvas that do a lot of really amazing work through their own emptiness of self in a place that um, mimics that and you have a powerful, powerful combination of energies from heaven working their magic into earth at an accelerated rate. But that's just story too, you gotta drop that. <laughs> but it's relatively real to the relative world, you know, there's some value to that. For me, I remember um, this is maybe seven years ago. I had a very clear, like, heightened free will moment, like at a soul level, so to speak, a choice point in my life as to how to continue. And I remember that, well, um, the choice or realization or insight or yeah, choice was since I can't be harmed no matter what, like since I know that I cannot ever be affected no matter what, um, I don't have verbal translation for this, so this is gonna sound a little cheesy, but it was along the lines of I might as well, like be here, like do whatever is possible to do because um, I don't need to maintain that even. I don't need to stay there. Since I know that what I am can never be affected, I don't really care what happens to these vehicles. I don't really care about the suffering that I would take on or reflect or exude, uh, the processes that I would continue to have as an individual, as a person, um, the whatever challenges, perspectives, 
denseness that I would have to encounter because, because my firm conviction that I cannot be affected no matter what, even when all my vehicles are affected. So I've had many, many experiences since then where all the vehicles, physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, are reflective of a journey or of causing a benefit or of someone else's journey. So it becomes a complete mirror experience and I, I experience everything they're experiencing as real as they experience it, including you know, the suffering and the pain. And the same goes to the collective. Um, I actually uh, shut off my mirroring capacity to the collective to some extent because it is impractical if I don't. Uh, I would just be crying all the time uh, or like hysterically laughing all the time, you know, it goes back and forth. So sometimes I open those floodgates and it's funny to see like it's always still there. It's like, oh, yep. <laughs> and then I close the door again or, you know, it's a transparent door, but it's a door um, so that I can f focus in a sense on certain things. But on a more individual level, um, those doors are fully open. And so whoever I encounter that is in some kind of agreement with me relationally, even if they don't know they have that agreement contractually or like at a higher level, um, I, f I feel and know and see what they are feeling and knowing and seeing. And so, um, so that's, that's, that's a, an act of giving, it's an act of offering something. It's an act of offering yourself as a mirror. And so the consequence is that you will experience certain things, that you will experience um, disease or stress or whatever it is that's happening. But, um, but since I know that I cannot be affected no matter what, I consciously chose that, okay, even though this might not be completely balanced and I'm not quite 100% sure how to keep this 100% balanced, I would rather say yes to the ride uh, than say no to the ride out of who, who would say no anyway, you know? Like, who, that would only be self-protection, that would only be the locational self. So, um, since then, that has amped up more. I've always had this quality of mirroring, like since I was a kid, but now became more consciously used, and um, yeah, and it's also the act of realizing that your personal life is basically non-existent. Like you basically don't have a personal right anymore. You give up personal rights in a way. Doesn't mean you never assert your rights or that you don't set certain standards or don't have parameters, but those are all because you are being in service and you need to balance that in the best possible way to be as efficient as being a service as you are consciously capable of being in that moment or in that scenario. But basically, if you are wanting to do this, if you do have a calling to transmute into a shepherding consciousness or a mirror consciousness uh, or a bodhisattva, then the process that you'll have to go through is one of death. It's one of many, 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 many deaths. Um, because anything in you that wants to have its personal life will be you know, ripped apart, at least that's been my experience. And I'm assuming that would be anyone else's experience because the nature of it is to be of service. And so, again, if you have any self-image or self-interest that you hold on to, the ride is gonna get really rough because you're holding on to it. So it's kind of like either you like your life and you just, you know, you empower yourself and you get glimpses of God and you feel really good and, you know, you share it a little bit um, and you're, you're, you're happy and what have you, you're awake you know, there's that, which is cool because it keeps your life intact, you know, and you have your life and your things. Or you turn to the bodhisattvic principle or the shepherding consciousness principle and that's quite an initiation process. Uh, and I don't quite know yet how I'm going to facilitate that, but I do have a desire to facilitate that more fully in addition to just laying out the teachings to actually facilitate that more with more support is part of my desire. I don't yet know what that's going to look like, but um, yeah, I mean, prepare yourself, honestly. If this is what you desire and you feel this calling, mm -hmm. it's a deep initiation process. It's, uh, it takes away everything that is you. That's what it needs to do. Um, and, yeah, and yet you're here. It's not like it takes away everything and then you're 
always in heaven. In a sense, you are, you know. But there's still also this level because you sign up for allowing your vehicle to be used when it's empty. So first you have to empty all the vehicles of a personal need and then, um, and then still keep it here or maintain it here for service. So you become a service animal. You know? <laughs> your life becomes about serving your master, which is humanity. At this point, humanity is your master. You're the slave. Masterful slave, but still slave. Out of your own free will, but still, that's what you choose, right? So all this stuff is crucial. Like without this, you won't get to the state where you can even really consider that. There's too many concepts in the way. You need to become empty, fundamentally empty, of your assumptions of self. Uh, and self-realization is crucial for that. And empowerment, the empowerment path or self-actualization will be helpful in allowing you to maintain balance on the level of the different vehicles from subtle to gross so that your service can be better, more efficient, more precise, more impeccable, more uh, enduring. Um, but that can't even be, it's just a concept. There's many people that say, yay, I'm shepherding consciousness. And like, no, you're not. Uh, you're just not. It's just too many concepts of self in the way. It's the self that's saying that, you know. It's the ego that's saying, yay, shepherding consciousness, woohoo. Um, <laughs> it's not that, you know, it's deep initiation. It's deep initiation into emptiness, into the void. Um, and it's good. I don't mean to make it sound depressing. You know, maybe I do. <laughs> but I, I guess why I'm taking on that tone a little bit or a quality somewhere in that range is so that you know you know what you're choosing, that it's not just a trap like, hey, you know, this is all bliss and the person in you is going to freak out and be super happy all the time. That's not what it is. That's not what the process entails. If that's what you like, go buy my book, Super Accelerated Living, you know. Um, go do the empowerment teachings. Uh, but if you want to be shepherding consciousness, that can only happen to someone who has a deep willingness at a soul level to be here to serve others and realizes that this life is not about them. It's about them being a vehicle of service. And then, I mean, you will experience beauty and depth and freedom that's unimaginable as well. You know. If um, you truly know intuitively that you're here to be one of those shepherds, is, is that the fastest way to dissolve any sense of self-image. And is that enough or is there something more? That? Yeah. Um, that and a combination of rubber meeting the road, meaning in your everyday encounters with your self-image, with your relationships, like over and over and over again, realizing what in you is still choosing option A, for example, out of self-interest or out of a need, and what part of you is choosing option B or wh what percentage of you is ready to choose option B, which is actually to be of service to whatever occurs in your field. So it's a combination of this. This will give you the capacity to realize that you're not important, right? You are, but you're not. You are, but you're not significant in the self-defining way that the ego tends to define itself. So it's a combination of being able to empty yourself out method 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 Methodically? Methodically. Diabolically. <laughs> this is definitely invaluable. This is crucial for becoming a shepherd in consciousness. If you don't realize at least the God state, free of individuation, but ideally also um, the void leading into the absolute realization, then it'll be very tough. It'll be very tough to, to meet the road with the rubber. Somebody else, because yeah. <laughs> you won't have uh, yeah you won't have the proper rubber to like I don't know. so yes this is crucial and then your everyday life experiences will will be called in to force you to be of service so as soon as you commit you'll get you'll get you know there's plenty of people knocking on your door plenty of opportunities so that's why I'm taking on this tone a little bit because I want you to also see and witness and experience um, the energy 
in terms of what it requires, just the commitment that it requires and the willingness, and over and over again, the willingness to die to whatever feels personally comfortable to you. Any sense of self-image just can't stay. And if, if your self-image is maintained in some way, if you still maintain a self-image, you'll create an impossible paradox around yourself where the only way to do the right thing, to sh choose shepherding consciousness, is to appear completely the opposite of how you would like to appear to others. I call this the dark night principle. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, prepare. Like, to go beyond friends and, 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 and family and partnerships and... Um, you have to be utterly willing to completely enter through an existential loneliness, in a sense, to then come out on the other end, which is very blissful and free and true. But you have to be willing over and over again to go through that existential loneliness, to purify yourself, to empty yourself. But, you know, you'll have more company if you live in Sedona. <laughs> that are of this nature, that are understanding of this process, which makes a big difference, I'm assuming. I didn't have that myself. So I'm curious how this process will be if there's greater facilitation uh, for others to go through those initiations. Um, maybe it's easier, maybe it's less productive, we'll, we'll see. It's probably easier because we're all raising the frequency to that level. So it, it'll probably be much easier actually, yeah, to go into it. So that's good, that's good. Less less having to go through loneliness. But still, you'll have to go, you'll have to face existential loneliness. And by loneliness, I don't just mean absence of others. I mean absence of understanding, absence of everything you desire, absence of recognition, absence of um, yeah, everything that feels comfortable or that you prefer. Absence of your own preferences. It's kind of a loneliness in a sense. It's an existential death. Cool. So... <laughs> Yeah, real brief? Yeah. Yeah. And this is along the nature also of, you know, future seasons. Might not be season two, but this is the type of stuff I want to address in greater depth as well. And we'll, we'll turn these seasons into uh, little booklets as well, or books. Yeah, I just wanted to give you some feedback about what you were just saying, is whether or not it's going to be helpful, because the whole reason why I'm here is because that's something that I desire for validation, especially through these harder, more or less human-like qualities that begin to come through as we begin to hold this energy and stuff like that. And I feel like, you know, it's, I feel like I need something else to hold me straighter, you know what I mean, at, at this stage, or mm -hmm. to, to keep keep going, because it's not going fast, it's not completing fast enough, like it keeps mm -hmm. dropping off. Mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know if that Meaning makes sense. Meaning a personal life comes back in? Well, the, yeah, the, the choice for that, it, it, it's like it becomes a little bit more lackadaisical. Yeah. And yet the, the completion still feels like it still needs to happen. But I was just thinking, like, the validation, I think, just helps so much. Like, the, yeah, you're, you know, and just having other people, too, to, who are going through it with you. And, yeah. then, and then it doesn't seem, because right now you look at the collective and it's like, well, fuck, I am fucking, you know. <laughs> I mean, my mind doesn't hardly work sometimes. You know what I mean? I'm talking and stuff like that, but I don't feel like a person. You know what I mean? Those kinds of things. And it Beautiful. Gets, it gets kind of scary, you know, yeah. for the person. Uh -huh. And so she latches back on, I think, sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. That's beautiful. Thank you. So, I mean, yeah, that's my intention, just to continue to set up this container and this community and c continue for it to up-level itself and grow and expand as well. So that everyone, whatever their desire is, or purpose, or sense of calling is, they can find support for that niche and, uh, to express themselves in that way. So, yeah, not much I can say to you now, other than, you know, bravo, awesome, keep the faith. Yeah. Okay, we got to wrap it up. Yeah. Okay. A couple of announcements. So this Saturday, July 1st, um, I'm leaving tomorrow, so I won't be here. Uh, so Saturday, there won't be another session. But um, Ela will be doing uh, Shoshin Yoga at Seven Centers Yoga from 4.30 to 5.30. These meetings, this one, or the next season, 
will resume July 26th, every Wednesday, 5 to 7 p.m. through August 30th. Um, one day event in London on July 9th, if you have any friends in London or Europe. And a five day retreat, I think it's a six day retreat, six day retreat in the Netherlands, July 10th through 16th, that will be live streamed. So, <laughs> that was Ela saying, oops. Um, and we have a one day event in Los Angeles, July 30th, and then there's one, one a month, I think. At least three are scheduled right now. So just go to bentinumasara.com slash events and check out all the events there. We have quite a few lined up now, which is unusual for us. Um, so check it out. And uh, see you guys back here when we get back. <laughs>